Good evening. Welcome. If you're here and willing and able to stand, please do. If you're participating from home, set aside whatever you're working on, participate with us in worship and as we study the word tonight. So let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you that your love is great and your love conquers all things. Lord, even as we go throughout our day and as we've gone throughout our day and we come together tonight to worship you and to fellowship with you, Lord, we know that your love is greater than anything that we experience today, that your love is greater than anything that we may have thought had overcome us today because your love always overcomes. And so, God, we thank you and we just praise you tonight for how great is your love. We love and thank you and give you the glory in Christ's name. Amen.
you 
one could express how much you try 
God, I thank you that through it all, we can all say it is well with our soul. Though this earth may shake, though things may trouble us, though we may become upon trials in our life, Lord, through it all, it is well. God, I thank you that your Holy Spirit is prevalent no matter where we are, that you're that omnipresent God, you're everywhere all the time, that you're omnip that omnipotent God who's all powerful, and you're that omniscient God who's all knowing. And so God, work in each one of our lives tonight. Lord, help us keep that to the front of our minds, to the front of our hearts, that no matter what we're going through, it is well. It is well with our soul. Lord, that makes us an overcomer. Lord, of what may be happening in our lives, what may be happening, uh, what's going on around us. We're overcomers, Lord, when we declare and believe that it is well. And in Christ, all things are well. Amen. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, Alex. Hi, Curtis. Hi, Joan. Hi, everyone. How's Ted? Good. We miss Ted. So if you um, are participating online or here and would like notes from tonight's message, you can go into the Facebook comments and just type notes, or you can also, um, on the text that you received uh, announcing tonight's message, you can reply to that with notes, and we'll, we'll send you those notes. Um, our automatic sender is not working yet. I don't know what's wrong, so that you'll get them sometime tomorrow when I get to them. So bear with us as we figure that out. So we're in, the, we're in a studies in the book of James. We're going to look at James chapter 4 verses 1 through 12 tonight, and we're going to talk about the danger of worldliness. And, you know, we, we see worldliness all around us, and we'll talk about what that means tonight. But as I was, as I was preparing for this message, and as we're coming upon uh, elections in just a couple weeks, I thought, you know, I really do love our country. I love our country. And even though our nation is not perfect, I still love our country. And our nation has never been perfect. And on this side of the new heaven and the new earth, there will never be a perfect nation. We can try, but there never will be a perfect nation or a perfect country. 
And we can look through history, we can look through our biblical history and see that every nation on earth since the fall has been affected by sin. No exemptions. Every, every nation has been affected by sin. But you know, we as a nation could do better than we're doing, couldn't we? And I believe that starts with believers, it starts with our prayer life, it starts with how we live, it starts out with how we love each other. And so right now, in our nation, you know, we're in a very unique situation in multiple facets. It can be scary at times to turn on the news. And it can, feel, it, can feel, it can feel very chaotic and even surreal when you're watching things happen in our own nation. You know, we think about the pandemic in this world. It's here because this is a world that's fallen, right? Injustice and racism are in the world because this world is fallen. Riots, anarchy, destruction exists because we live in a fallen world. So sin created brokenness. Right? Sin created brokenness. Go back to the beginning of the Bible and we'll see how sin created brokenness. But God is still on the throne throughout all that brokenness. We still have victory throughout all that brokenness. And so at the root of every person outside of Christ, so at the root of every person outside of Christ, is a heart that's far from God. At the root of every person outside of Christ is a heart far from God in need of God's grace. We see that every day, don't we? And so we live in a fallen world. We live in a world system that has values, beliefs, and morals that are, indirectly, that are directly in conflict with God's will. We see it all the time. Turn on the news, read the newspaper, go to work, go out on the street. Values, beliefs, and morals that are, that are in direct conflict with God's will. And the Bible speaks to worldliness as, as an idea of our op operating according to this sin-marred system that we live in. So the world system that we live in has been marred by sin, hasn't it? And, and what happens is people align with these rebellious, sinful ways instead of God's ways. We need to be aligning with Scripture and live according to Scripture and not aligning with rebellious, sinful man's ways. And we align with Satan's ways instead of with God's ways. And, we, uh, and, and it's, a work, it's at work in this world, and it's at work in our nation, it's at work in our community, and it's even at work in our church. And so James addresses worldliness in James chapter 4. And, and the only hope for this world, there's only one hope for this world, most of us know that, and that's for people to recognize that the world that we live in is fallen, and it's due to our sin, right? And our only hope is to turn to Jesus and experience the grace of God. Without that, there is no hope. Many of us have lived part of our lives or a lot of our lives with little hope until we accept the grace of Christ, right, into our lives. So tonight, James addresses those in the church. Remember, the, the, the book of James is written to the church. And he's asking us to look inward and allow God's grace to conquer any hint of worldliness that's in our hearts. And for those given over to worldliness, held captive to the broken world system, he's saying, come to God. So he's asking us to look at our hearts. If there's any worldliness in there, uh, let God's grace conquer that. And if you're overcome and you're given into this worldliness, we need to turn and come to God. So let's read James 4, 1 through 12 to start with. And we'll put those on the screen for you. Where do, this is, it's so, this is so appropriate for today. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Look at our world. Look at our country. There's people warring and fighting over the silliest things. Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war. You let... Or, uh, Yet, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not, not, do you not, I'll get it, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy? But he gives more grace. Therefore he says, 
God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your, ha cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and, the, and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge one another? There's a lot there. One commentator looks at verses 4 through 10 and says that's kind of the heart of the book of James. It's chapter 4, verses 4 through 10. And he call, it's really a call for us to repent of any behavior that's worldly. doesn't matter what it is. It can be pride, it can be jealousy, it can be envy, it can be hatred. We're to repent of any behavior that's worldly. And as we've looked through the book of James, there's been a lot, in a sense, where James has addressed uh, the worldliness of partiality we talked about. We talked about uh, being a hearer only and not a doer of the word. We talked about the use of the tongue. Last week we talked about false wisdom and how it manifests itself in many ways. And so the big idea tonight is only God's grace can conquer the worldly heart. Only God's grace can conquer the worldly heart. So point number one I want to make tonight is worldly conflict comes, worldly conflict with others comes from within. Worldly conflict with others comes from within. It doesn't come from the outside, it comes from the inside. So James asks the questions in James 4.1, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war is that for pleasure that war is I'll get it. Desires for pleasure that war in your members. So do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? So James is using a very, he's using very aggressive language here. He's speaking of a war that's within us, right? That war for that desire of pleasure in us. And so apparently during that time, probably like there is today, there's a lot of fighting going on even in the church. And James seems to be pointing out that it has the potential to get violent, right? It's not just, uh, I stick my nose up at somebody, I'm going to verbally ag be aggressive or physically aggressive. And remember from, from, from chapter 3, we talked about last week that those who are operating in true wisdom will be peacemakers. Remember last week, those of you who are here or who are participating online, we talked about that true wisdom makes us a peacemaker. And those who are operating according to worldly or false wisdom, right, they bring chaos and they bring disorder. And we talked about how people who just have that false wisdom that chaos follows them, disorder follows them, it's all around them, and, and it's breeding fights, and it's breeding quarrels, and wars of words, and agendas, and it, it's, it's ugly, doesn't it? Let's jump down to James 4, 11 to 12. He says, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Then he says, there is one lawgiver, capital L, who is able to destroy, say, who is able to save and to destroy, who are you to judge one another? So James is warning us and them not to speak evil against one another, right? We should never speak evil against one another. He says, if you speak evil against meaning slander, right? A brother, you ju or judge them, standing over them in a critical, overly scrutinizing sort of way. He says, you speak evil against the judge and judge the law. You're judging the law. Why? Because the law condemns those things. The law condemns us to speak evil against each other. The law condemns us from uh, uh, speaking slander against each other. And so you're putting yourself over the law. And if you judge the law, he says, you are not a doer of it, but a judge of it. And there only can be one judge and only one uh, lawgiver, right? And that's God. And then he says, God can save and God can destroy. So who are we to judge? Who are we to condemn? And who are we to overly criticize and scrutinize our neighbor? And so we're seeing here this horizontal issue in the church, like how we treat our neighbor, how we love our neighbor. How, and he's, he's talking about how we may judge 
or criticize our neighbor. And that's a horizontal issue, but it really points to our vi vertical uh, relationship or a vertical relational issue with God. And many times those who speak evil of and those who slander others, they're really having an issue with their relationship with God. Because if we make a relationship with God the priority and correct, then the relationship with our neighbor is easier and more manageable and we live that correctly. So when one's a miss, the other's a miss. Follow the logic there? And so, um, and so when we speak evil of others and when we slander others, it's an issue with God. Our relationship with God is not correct. Your heart is not right with God. Where does that come from? James says in 4.1, it's the passions inside you that war within you. And the word here for passions is the Greek word where we get our word hedonism. You've heard of that word hedon? You're, you, you're a hedon? Right, hedonism. And the idea is sinful desires. So you can have good passions, right? I can have a passion to study the word of God, but that's not the word that's being used here. He's using that word passion or hedonism, that sinful desire. Then we read in James 4, 2, For you lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight and war, you do not have because you do not ask. In the English Standard Version, it says, you desire and you do not have, so you murder. That's powerful. You desire, do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You desire, you don't have, so murder. Right? And many times it's murdering with our words. We're not talking about maybe physical murder. Douglas Moo comments that James seems to be pointing out that there's a hypothetical eventuality to their behavior if it goes uncurbed. So he's, he's referring to that desire, we desire, we don't have, we desire, we don't have, we don't desire, then we start to murder with our words, and we could murder with our hands. So if they continue to covet in the church and desire other people's material things, other people's way of life, etc., and to be ruled by the sinful desire in our heart, that's where it'll lead us. Murder. Murder with our mouth, murder with our lifestyle. So, you know, sin always grows. If you don't curb sin in your life, it'll just grow, and it'll grow, and it'll grow. It always escalates. It's kind of like a gremlin, right? How many remember the 80s movies, the gremlins? Some of you may or may not. Um, they were cute little fluffy, I don't know what they were, but they were cute little fluffy things. But if you fed them after midnight, they became monsters, right? They got all ornery and started chewing on things. But sin is, is the worst kind of gremlin because if you feed sin at all, it becomes a monster, right? It will grow into a more and more disastrous monster. So yes, coveting can grow into murder. The small, I mean, we call it, we may think coveting is a small sin, but if you don't curb that and you let that go on and on and on in your life, it can grow into murder. And the root of murder, quarrels, and fights, and all those outward conflicts are rooted in the, uh, the broken world's way, and it's the desire of really what's in your heart. It goes back to your heart, just like we talked about the last couple weeks. It's in us. And so man's, man's main problem is man. Our, our biggest problem usually is the guy in the mirror, or the gal in the mirror. Oh, Satan made me do it. I love that one right? No, our main problem is usually us. So a worldly heart will live to, towards, or will lead to worldly living. It will lead us to a worldly attitude. So if our heart's worldly, we'll have a worldly attitude. If our heart's worldly, we'll have worldly behaviors. If our heart's worldly, we'll have worldly relationships. If our heart's worldly, we'll have worldly ways of dealing with conflict. You can trace it. You see the fights. You see the quarrels. Quarrels, trace it to things like covetousness. Trace it to things like sinful desire, which all of that lives in the heart. It starts in the heart and it develops its way out. The most amazing thing about the power of the gospel is how it can change our want to, right? So before we were saved, we may want to live a certain way. And after Christ enters our heart, after we accept the gospel into our lives, our want to changes. I love to see the change in people's want to. I don't know if that's proper English or not, Joan, but tonight it is. <laughs> Our want to changes, right? And, and obviously, we still battle a desire for sin, or we wouldn't sin, but the want to changes, right? 
We don't go sleep around like we did before we were saved. And we may not go drink and party like we did before we were saved. And we watch our tongue more closely than before we were saved. And so the overwhelming desire of the redeemed here is to love and honor God. That should be our overwhelming desire, to love and honor God and obey God. So if the gospel, it is the gospel that changes our want to, right? The gospel changes our want to. The good news of Jesus Christ is our continual hope for seeing our desires changed. I remember my desires before I got saved and I remember my desires after I got saved. They're completely different. They're not the same thing, right? We become more and more and more like Christ. So look at your life. Look at your life tonight. Are there worldly conflicts in your life? Are you quarreling and fighting in your life? Remember, that comes from worldly desires that are in your heart like coveting. And, and notice this is affecting their prayer life. If we look at James uh, in the end of verse 2 into 3, he says, you do not have because you do not ask. Many people take this and say, well, you don't have something because you don't ask for it. But I want you to think about this differently tonight. He says, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. On one hand, some don't have because they have a sinful desire to covet and they don't have a holy desire to pray. So instead of asking God with a holy desire, we covet and want. That's part of it. So the prayerlessness creeps in. We just covet, right? Worldliness always leads to prayerlessness. That's the rap, prayerlessness. I don't know if that's a word either. Jones is going to correct me of all my English. So the more worldly we are, the less likely we are to pray. Does that make sense? We all know that because we've lived in it. On the other hand, some ask, but they don't receive. Why? Because they're asking wrong, or wrongly. They ask with the wrong desires, right? I want Tom's car because it's better than my car. That's really kind of a coveting way to ask. And so if I go to God and say, God, give me his car because it's better than my car, right? I'm asking, but I'm asking with the wrong desire. And so I'm asking maybe to spend it on my passion, not, not on truly what God would intend. So when people do ask, their sinful desires are their motive for asking. It's what I sinfully desire instead of what God is asking me to desire. So our heart problems, our heart problems will always cause prayer problems. Your heart problem will always cause a prayer problem. When we have fights and when we have quarrels with each other, it's very symptomatic of something bigger. And that means our relationship with God is amiss, or our relationship with God is out of line. So worldly conflicts, number one, uh, with others come from within. Number two, worldliness leads to enmity. We'll talk about what that word means in a moment, with God. So in verse four, we read in James 4, 4, adulterous Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. There's your word enmity, your enemy of God, right? So James calls those consumed by these fights and evil desires adulterous people. That's a little harsh, isn't it? He's not talking about physical adultery. He's talking about spiritual adultery. And so when we hear the word adulterer, we think about a man who's, who cheats on his wife. And we think about adulteresses, we think about a woman who cheats on her husband. But what James is referring to here is our spiritual adultery. We're cheating on our Heavenly Father. We're spiritually cheating on God. You know, in the Old Testament, at times, it would link spiritual idolatry to adultery, right? Right? So when you'd have an idol in your life and you'd worship an idol and put that before God, the Old Testament would call you an adulterer because you're cheating on God, basically. Claiming to know God, people were worshiping themselves. They were loving sin. They were loving idols instead of loving God. Look at the end of James 4.4. 4. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The word enmity that we saw in the beginning of the verse is hostility or war. So if we go back to, why don't you bring the first part of uh, verse 4 up, I'm sorry, again. Adulterers and adulteresses, did you know that, did you, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Friendship with the world is meaning you're at war with God. That's what that word enmity means. The idea is by befriending the world, you declare war with God. That doesn't mean we can't like the people that we work with. 
That doesn't mean we can't like Walmart, right? That doesn't mean we can't like Taco Bell. No, it means don't put the things of the world in God's place. Don't love them more than God, right? Don't live in the world's systems outside of God's system because then we declare war with God. So remember the world here is not about uh, befriending a lost person. It's not about loving a lost person. It's not about loving someone who needs some help. It's not about helping someone who needs help. It's not about befriending your neighbor. It's choosing to live according to the values, the beliefs, and the morals that are not right with God's revealed will. So that's your def definition of worldly. You're choosing to live according to the values, beliefs, and morals that are not in line with God's will. How do you know what God's will is? Your scripture. Open your Bible. It tells you what God's will is, right? Kevin DeYoung says, it's whatever makes sin look good and righteousness seem strange. I like that. It's whatever makes sin look good and righteousness seem strange. John said it this way in 1 John 2, chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, now he's telling us what the world is, right? It's not about loving your neighbor or loving Taco Bell, right? Or befriending a lost person. It says, for, the, for all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So what's the opposite in the passage of worldliness? Doing the will of God, right? We can live for the world. We can have those things, that the values, beliefs, and morales of this world. Or we can, we can live according to the will of God. So God and worldliness are opposed. They're at conflict with each other. They're at war with each other. They're at enmity with each other. And, and we, can't, we can't operate outside of God's will, in rebellion to God's plans, purpose, and written word, and still claim to walk with God. You can't walk on one side of the fence and claim to be on the other side of the fence. And so the worldly sins in this text are, are, are not the things traditionally um, railed against. It's relational conflict. It's coveting. It's prayerlessness. It's selfish prayer. So that's what he's kind of referring to as worldliness. And so if you expand this throughout the book of James, remember we talked about sinful partiality and we talked about racism, right? That's what he's referring to. We talked about misuse of the tongue. That's worldliness. We talked about the false wisdom last week. That's worldliness. We talked about being double-minded. That's worldliness. We talked about being a hearer but not a doer of the word. That's worldliness. And we talked about injustice towards the poor as we will see. Actually, we haven't seen it. We'll see that in chapter 5. And so all of this would likely fit into the category of worldliness, right? The, the partiality, racism, improper use of your tongue, false wisdom, being double-minded, being a hearer and not a doer of the word, injustice to the poor. We'll see those things are in the category of, of, of worldliness. And James is rebuking the church at this, in this letter for that. He, there's a lot of wars that we can win, but you'll not win a war with God. Right? So when we're in enemy, en enmity with God, when we're at war with God because of our worldliness, we're not going to win. We may feel like it and look like it, but we're not going to win. You know, the U.S., if, if, a nation, if a nation were to bomb the U.S., so if we would go home tonight and we see that there's a bomb coming from another country, it would be considered an act of war. Right? There's a bomb in the air. That's an act of war. And the U.S. would say, you obviously don't want to be friends with us, do you? You're attacking us. And the U.S. then would decide how they're going to respond. We've seen it with 9-11, right? We saw, we saw people from another country come in and, and, and declare war on our country, and we had to respond in a certain way. And so the U.S. would then decide, if a bomb was coming over, how to respond. And it would not be the U.S. who desired conflict. It wasn't, we didn't initiate it, somebody else initiated it. The conflict is created by the aggressor. And so sin is an act of war with God. Think about that. When we sin, 
we're declaring war against God. God's not the aggressor. We are the aggressor, right? Worldliness is the environment and the system created by sin. And it's a system of rebellion against God. So to be a friend of the world, again, the world's beliefs, morals, and, and things of the world, means that we're rebelling against God. You are the aggressor, not God. God desires peace, right? God is just. God is holy. And, and if you make yourself an enemy, when you choose friendship with, the, with this world, you're the one firing the bomb, not God. A lot of people blame God for a lot of stuff when we're the aggressor, right? But God won't lose the war. We may initiate the war, but he won't lose the war. So if you're in Christ, if you're believe, a believer, you have peace with God through Christ. So that war is no longer there. We're now at peace. We're in peacetime. The warning here would be, why are you living like someone who's at war with God? Right? Why do people do that? Either they don't know better or they don't know better. Right? They're not living at peace with God. The danger is, is if a life continually shows that you're at war with God, maybe you don't have the peace of Christ in your life that you claim you do. If you're constantly rebelling against God, maybe you don't have the peace through Christ that you claim you have. If your heart remains worldly, um, maybe you're not changed in the heart. So James 4, 5 is considered probably one of the hardest verses in the, in the, uh, I've heard of, one of the hardest verses to translate in the New Testament, and I found it here in the English Standard Version. I think it probably says it the best in James 4, 5. Do you suppose... It is to no purpose that scripture says he yearns jealousy over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. So let me read it again. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that scripture says he, being God, yearns jealousy over our spirit that he made to dwell in us. The point is, is God created the spirit that lives in all of us, right? He gave it to us. He desires for us then to live for him and to worship him. That's his desire, for us to live for him and to worship him. You know, the Old Testament uh, speaks of God as being a jealous God, right? And he desires his glory. And what's best for you is to worship him, is to bow down before him. And so the worldliness then prevents people from living for and worshiping God. Again, you can't be in both sides of the fence. So just like worldliness affects our prayer life, it also affects our ability to live for God and our ability to worship God. It's utter rebellion against him. So God demands that we align with him. He wants us to align with his word. And, he wants, uh, uh, and God makes living that possible. He makes living his word out possible. Isn't that good? Number three. So worldly, worldly conflicts with others come with, from within. Worldliness leads to war or division with God, and gr God's grace can conquer worldliness. God's grace can conquer worldliness. James 4, 6 says, but he gives more grace. I love that there's always more grace that comes from God. You think you've gotten it all, but guess what? He's got more, right? He's a never-ending fountain of grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so the answer to worldliness uh, the answer to God's demand that we live for him and worship him, the answer to being God's enemy is God's grace, right? And that's the unmerited favor of God, the undeserved favor of God. So if I go out and I take a baseball bat to Joan's car, smash it up, and she goes out and she looks at it, she goes, oh, don't worry about it. I'll just pay to get it fixed. You go home, have a good night. That's unmerited favor, right? I don't deserve that. She deserves to call the cops on me and have me thrown in jail. But God's grace is unmerited favor. So God gives more grace. His grace is greater than our sin. Think about that. His grace is greater than our sin. His grace is enough to deliver us out of anything that we may have created or we may have walked into. His grace is great enough. Uh, his grace is enough to empower us. And so God can save us from our worldly sinful ways and your worldly sinful ways, and your neighbor's worldly sinful ways. And God, in his grace, will transform us and empower us to live for and worship him. And so James points out scripture, and he says that it teaches that God opposes the proud, right? We see that, but gives grace to the humble. 
And so the message of, our, of the Bible in general is, is that if we remain in sin, we continue to live a sinful lifestyle, we make God our enemy. And his judgment will be crushing. Right? It may not be in this life, but it'll be in the next life. However, God is our only hope. He is our only hope. And if we turn to him and receive his grace, we can then, excuse me, be friends with God. We can be reconciled with God. Worldliness makes God out to be the bad guy. So we're worldly. We make poor decisions. Bad things happen. We blame God, right? And, and, and so worldliness makes God out to be the bad guy. And, and we think that God is just there to ruin our life and to control us. Because the things that we want to do just aren't working out. But God is really the hero, isn't he? He's the only one who can save you from you. He's the only one who can save you from you. He's the only one who can save you from sin. He's the only one that can save you from destruction. He's the only one that can save you out of the snare or the trap of worldliness. So believers are those who have experienced that grace, God's grace. And we know God's grace is chiefly expressed in the sending of his son Jesus, right? He sent his son to die in our place and he rose again. And, and if we need to be reminded tonight of what God's grace looks like, look to Jesus. Because that's a perfect picture of God's grace. Look to Jesus. Look to the cross and look to what Jesus did on the cross. Look to the empty tomb, that he didn't stay dead, that he rose again. And understand that God's grace can do more than save us. Yes, we're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, but his grace can do more than save us. His grace also, uh, it, so it does more than save us from sin's penalty. His grace empowers us to then live for God's glory. It's more than just saving grace. He's empowering us to live for his glory. And so the answer for every person who are either friends with the world, enemies with God, is a need for God's grace. We all need God's grace, no matter where we are in our walk. And so the God that you're shaking your fist at, if, you don't, if, you're, if you're living the way you want to live, the God that you've declared war with, he's really your only hope. You're fighting against your ally, right? You're fighting against the one who can save you because his grace is great. And if you remain proud in your sin, God will oppose you, he says. So we are to humble ourselves. We're to receive the grace that he offers in Jesus, the grace to conquer the sin, and the grace that empowers us to live according to his will. Grace to be delivered from its penalty, the sin's penalty, and empowers us to live a life in victory over sin for God's glory. Finally, I think finally, number four, we must humbly come to God. So James is painting a picture of humility before God. It's not just that we are humble when we get saved. We need to be humble after we're saved, right? Humility before God. And that's a picture of repentance. If you want to know what humility looks like, the best way I can describe it is repentance. It's what it, and that's what it looks like to come, humbly come before God and receive his grace. Let's look at verse 7 of chapter 4. He says, therefore submit to God. That submission is a humble process. When you submit to somebody, you're putting yourself underneath their authority. That's humbling, right? Then he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. He says, submit. Worldliness is rebellion against God. That's not submitting to God. And it's rebellion against God's will. And we can't repent of that if we don't submit or come underneath God's authority. So submitting to God and resisting the devil go hand in hand. You can't do one without the other, right? Oh, I'm going to go to the bar tonight, and I'm going to have 12 beers, but I'm not going to have 13, right? Probably I'll have 16, right? So submitting to God and resisting the devil go hand in hand. You can't be full, fully submitted to God's will under the lordship of Christ and then give yourself over to the devil's worldly ways. It just doesn't work. And that's a reminder that worldliness is spiritual warfare. We talked about spiritual warfare on Sunday if you were here. And, and by the way, repentance is spiritual warfare. It's coming against the flesh. It's coming against the spirit or against sin. And Satan is at work in this world. We know that. And Jesus says, resist him, or James says, resist him, and he will flee. So we live in a spiritual world, don't we? Just like we live in a natural world, we live in a spiritual world as well. And, and real things are at stake in this life. We have a real enemy. 
And so he's at work in fights, he's at work in quarrels, and he's at work in covetousness. And he longs for us to give in to our sinful desires. And so we're to receive peace with God through Jesus Christ and declare war on the devil. Not to declare war on God, we're to to declare war on the devil. In verse 8 of chapter 4, it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. James says, draw near, that's an invitation. So if I say, Tom, draw near to me, he'll get up out of his chair and draw near to me. It's an invitation to draw near to God through Christ. So repentance is more than just turning from sin. We talk about repentance doing that 180 turn. I'm living one way, I'm going to turn around to the other. And the turning is part of repentance, but walking towards God is the other part. So we turn away from that sinful desire, we turn away from that, live, that sinful lifestyle, but then we start walking towards God. So, so repentance is, is turning. And, 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 and it's not about simply stopping something, it's turning to God and drawing near to him through Jesus Christ. And when we do that, naturally he draws near to us. So if Tom draws near to me, naturally I'm going to draw closer to him, right? Think about, uh, uh, think about it, the one James says that we're declaring war with or having enmity with is God, right? Or was God. And he offers to draw near to God, if they will. And God wants us to do that, and that's through repentance. We turn away from whatever lifestyle that's not God-glorifying or not according to God's will, and we walk towards God. He wants us to be close to him. God desires us to be close to him. He wants a relationship with us. So believer, if you've wandered, God wants you to come home, right? He wants you to come home. We also read in James 4, at the end, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Cleanse and purify. They're together. Uh, The call here is to cleanse your heart. That's inside. Purify your hands. That's outside. And that's really Old Testament language, if we think about it. And it speaks to to the need to deal with the inward problem as well as the outward problem. And these these are the things that we may need to stop doing as part of our repentance process. And we must also then ask God to do the heart work. So it's not just something we physically stop doing. We have to lose that desire as we talked about Sunday, right? Sinful desires come from where? Inside the heart. So we have to ask God to work in our heart and deal with our desires. So when we deal with fights, the physical fights and quarreling that James is talking about, we still have to deal with the heart issue as well. Then we read in verse 9, Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and joy to gloom. Mourn our sin is what he's saying. Mourn over sin. And so verse 9 describes that overall attitude of repentance. We're to mourn over the wrongdoing. If we're really repentant, we'll mourn over our sin, not laugh at it. There's a lot of people that will tell you about their sin and they'll, they'll make it like a trophy and they'll laugh it off. And that's not repentance. We need to mourn over it. God wants us to have joy, but not to have joy in our sin. So repentant people mourn their sin. We're to hate it. We're to, re- it's to, repul- we're to be repelled from it. We're to turn from it. Next, and in, in I'm almost finished here, in James 4.10, it says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. So James is saying when we humble ourselves before God, he exalts us. It's almost kind of like an oxymoron, right? The lower we get, the higher he lifts us. The lower we get, the higher he lifts us. If we hold our head high in pride and rebellion, God will bring you low, right? We all know that. If we humble ourselves in repentance, God will lift us up, he'll forgive us, and empower us to live for him. Amen? So let's stand, if you would. So whether you're a believer, maybe and you're flirting with worldliness, or maybe you're someone that's just enslaved in sin and the world, and you need to be set free, both people need repentance. If you're just flirting with worldliness, you need repentance. If you're bound with sin and worldliness, you need repentance. We need to humble ourselves, right? And receive God's grace. You're to mourn your sin and submit to God. We're to turn away from sin. That repentance is that turning away and walk towards God, and God gives his grace. That's what the gospel is. It's saying, I no longer can control and no longer want to control my own life. God, I want you on the throne of my life. Right? And giving our lives to Christ. That's what that means. You know what our nation needs right now is for people to humbly turn to God. 
We look at all the stuff going on in our country. The best cure for that is they just need to humbly turn to God. Right? Quit living in the world systems. Quit living in the worldly desires. Quit living in the world's chaos and humbly turn to God. And if we turn to God and receive God's grace, we would see problems in this world, in our nation, in our city, in our country completely disappear. The way of worldliness is abundant in our nation. It's everywhere we go. We see it, don't we? People call good evil. And they call evil good. That's backwards, right? And, and, and so the way of worldliness is so prevalent in our country. People do right, what's right in their own eyes. Well, I think this is right, so therefore, it's right, right? It doesn't matter what the Word of God says. No, nope, because I think it's right to go burn my neighbor's building down. I'm going to go burn my neighbor's building down. So our nation needs to see the church, right? The peop not the building, the people, believers. We need to see, they need to see the church turn from our worldliness and point them to God. And they need to see people who mourn sin. They need to see that lived out in our lives so they know how to live it out in their lives. They need to see us submit to God so they know how to submit to God. They need to see us resist the devil so they know they can resist the devil. And the world needs to see people who live on a mission with clean hands and a pure heart. Amen? And so if we want to see a great awakening in our nation, it really starts with a great revival in the church. It has to start with the believers. It has to start with those who know the word of God. It has to start with you, and it has to start with me. That's the only way that this world has hope, right? We have to live that out by example. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that your grace is a solution to worldliness. Lord, that when we humble ourselves before you, when we put ourselves below you, that you exalt us. When we resist the devil, he will flee. And so, God, I ask you tonight that you help all of us purify our hearts, purify the sinful desires and the worldliness that may be in our hearts, cleanse that. Lord, let us desire to live a, a way that's, that's according to your will, not that's in enmity or in war against you. God, help us to fight those things that, that, that we shouldn't be doing and fight those things that we shouldn't be, the way we shouldn't be living. And it's really not a fight when we're submitting to you because you just take care of it for us. So it's not about uh, white knuckling and saying, God, I got to stop, I got to stop. No, it's about submitting ourselves to you, letting you cleanse our heart, repenting, turning away from whatever it is and walking towards you and you'll cleanse our hearts. You'll exalt us. You'll give us the strength and the wisdom and the guidance, Lord, to overcome anything that's worldly that may be in our lives. And God, we pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders. Lord, we pray that you give us as believers the ability to be salt and light in their lives. Lord, to show them what it means to live as a believer, to show what it means to, to live in victory, to show what it means to live as, uh, in a repentant, with repent, a repentant heart, Lord, and, and according to your will. Lord, let us learn to be in your word morning, day, and night. Lord, if we want to know what you want from us, we open the word of God, and it tells us what you want from us. Lord, we pray to you, and you speak to our hearts. We heed the Holy Spirit and we follow how the Holy Spirit is directing us. So God, I pray for each one that's here tonight. I pray for each one that's participating online that you give us that strong desire just to cast out those things that don't belong in our lives. Lord, and your grace allows us to do that. Your grace empowers us to live in a way that's honoring to your will. Not just saves us, but empowers us to continue walking and living a life that's God-honoring. So God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your never-ending love. Lord, because it is greater than anything that we can ever accomplish, ever run into, ever experience in this world. So God, we love you. We thank you. We give you the praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. to all.
Jesus' name, amen.